everyone. Good evening and welcome to the second edition of PDA Online Poetry Festival, organized by Ideas in Progress in association with Padishala and Cam Design, titled Polyphony of Global Voices, Readings of Poets in Praxis. Thank you all for being here. My name is Deepa and I'm the presenter of today's session. PDA Online Poetry Festival, POP Festival, is an attempt to explore the versification practice of English poets of the day. In the seven edition, uh, sessions in the second edition of the event, we have seven poets in focus who shall be listened to, and we have young scholars and faculties joining us who shall carry the conversation with those in focus. At the outset, let me introduce the three organizations that have come together to make this event possible. Ideas in Progress, Padashala, and Cambazine. Ideas in Progress, an organization that had been engaging with the society for over the past 20 years, helps to bring about spontaneity in expression by kindling the aesthetic sensibility within through a creative process. They open up opportunities to engage with artists from various fields, including poets, musicians, painters, sculptors, film and theater enthusiasts, to share, nurture, guide, and motivate creative engagement. It thereby attempts to fill the ideological vacuum by spurring original thought in a critical endeavor. In collaboration, we have with us Padashala, which is an informal collective of friends at Sri Shankaracharya University of Sanskrit, which was formed in 2015 to inspire, engage, and involve the academia with the society thereby trying to bridge the gap formed due to differences of varied kinds. Our focus is on academic engagements and therefore our target is creating brighter minds. Yet another collaborator is Cambazine.com, which is an independent bilingual online platform for connecting campus to the community. It helps students and educators by providing the latest news, resources and reports on university matters learners in forming collaborative alliances and provides a valuable resource bank for the exchange of information, ideas, and best practices in academia. Let me introduce the curator, Mr. Chandramohan. Chandramohan Satyanadin uh, is an Indian English Dalit poet and literary critic based in Trivandrum. His accolades include being on the shortlist for the Srinivas Rai Prol Poetry Prize 2016 and a fellowship at the International Writing Program at the University of Loa. His book of poems titled Letters to Nam Dasan 2016 was on the shortlist for the Yuva Puraskar of Sahitya Academy. Let me put on record our sincere gratitude to you for having made this possible. It is also my pleasure to welcome the chair for today's session, Dr. Kavida BK. Dr. Kavida has been working as Assistant Professor of English at Gorman College for Women, Trivandrum, for the last 12 years. She's interested in Dalit literature, and her PhD thesis uh, was on Dalit women's poetry. I take this opportunity to welcome you, ma'am, to chair and interact with the poet in focus, unfurling her poetic journey, its philosophy, politics, and method to us. Before Thank you, Deepak. Before we begin, a few quick housekeeping guidelines for this webinar. The poet in focus will first read out her poems and then the chair shall engage in a conversation with her. While they are in conversation, participants can ask questions using the chat feature of Zoom. May we also request you to maintain your video and audio on mute until or unless asked to unmute. On behalf of Ideas in Progress, Padishala and Cam Design, may I thank you all once again for joining us today. I request all participants online who haven't joined the WhatsApp group to join using the link that will be shared soon over the chat box. We look forward to your participation in this and future sessions organized by us. Now, it is indeed my pleasure to introduce and welcome the poet in focus, Aparna Lenjava Bose, an associate professor at the School of Literary Studies, English and Foreign Language University, Hyderabad, is a Triling, Indian trilingual writer, poet, critic, and translator. Besides publishing several articles, papers, reviews, poems, and translations in journals, anthologies, and books, 
in Marathi, English, and Hindi. She published two books of poetry titled In the Days of uh, Cages and Could You Be? She has to her credit a book of poetry translation titled Red Slogans on the Green Grass, besides compiling and editing two books on Marathi short stories and poetry, respectively, titled Pakshin Ani Chakravyu and uh, Vadal Uthanar Ahe. She has edited and introduced a collection of critical essays titled Writing Gender, Writing Self, Memory, Memoir, and Autobiography, and has translated poems from Marathi, Dalit, and tribal women under the title Silence Speak. She was part of the Saiti Academy's Writers and Scholars delegation to Moscow and Istanbul in 2009. Madam, we are indeed honored to have you with us this evening as a poet in focus at the second session of, uh, sorry, at the fourth session of season two of this Festival of Poems. Thank you for joining us. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Deepak, for that most generous introduction. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm actually a professor now at the English and Foreign Languages University, uh, retrospectively. That's, some, that's the latest development, so I might as well share that little uh, piece of news. Uh, thank you, uh, Chandra Mohan, for curating this and uh, calling me up and telling me that, you know, I should be part of this. It's indeed a pleasure. Kavita, who is chairing the today's session, to all the participants who have joined from far and wide. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be amongst all of you. And uh, I know this is not going to be my regular lecture kind of thing. So I look towards a more interactive uh, kind of a, a, a session. Uh, may I uh, ask Chandra Mohan, uh, how do I go about it? Do I start with my readings and then uh, we take interventions or how, how do we? Yeah, yeah. Of... I, I think you can start with your po po poems. Okay. Then make, you so, can take, take a break after you've read a few of them. Yeah. And then maybe. Sure. Like, uh, the translations, or, yeah. maybe uh, exactly, get into exactly. the translations yeah, yeah. also. Also, you because can I guess... talk, about, yeah, talk, talk about whatever you wanted to say. You know? About, <laughs> okay. Like, yeah. All right. About writing, so, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that would depend on what kind of uh, queries, uh, you know, people have, uh, you know, uh, the participants wish to uh, ask or oh, Kavita, perhaps uh, she might want to take up uh, a cue from what the participants would be asking me. But uh, as you suggest, then uh, let me start with a couple of my uh, poems and then kind of take a break and uh, wait for uh, some deliberations to, to uh, begin. So uh, my first poem that I have here, and I feel uh, extremely ashamed and sorry at the same time to say that uh, since I'm away from home and have been traveling uh, after a fairly, fairly long time, I'm really not carrying uh, my books with me. So whatever little resources I could manage to get from my emails, uh, you know, and my communications, I've just managed to uh, scribble them and uh, I have them here for you. Perhaps uh, had I been back home in Hyderabad, I would have been even more, uh, you know, uh, prepared, I must say, uh, with, my, with my other uh, poems uh, and, and uh, literary works. Uh, nevertheless, to start the session today, I have a poem titled, A Truth, and it's bracketed, This is for Real. They think that they have the right to write about me. They think that they have the right to write about me, to speak about me, to look at me, to name me. They will probably write a natural romantic story of a girl full of concessions, whose enslaved forefathers slogged door to door, who was fed with sun, water, air, and earth, whose parents forsook her in the land of strangers. And they will write how her living was freight with troubles and sorrows, how loneliness nibbled her thought and how time inflicted scars. They will speak a natural truth in their native voice, how father immersed in a 10 to six shift 
and how he got boozed on his way home. How the furrows on mother's hands widened and how she aged before her aging. How in their routine squabbles, the kids agitated, shrieked, shivered in restless motion and how together they spent difficult days. And they will speak of him as Messiah, everyone who would seek, seek my shelter. And in the name of a tolerant culture, with hatred, they will spare two select days of the year and then taunt my entire tribe with erratic economics as beneficiaries of government's unrestricted pity. They will watch holding hand grenades, my going and coming hence, while blood shooting eyes will rain Vesuvius fireballs. Their caltrop gaze will then shower innumerable calling of names and their obsolete ancient look would scrutinize my wearing. And they will watch with programmed pride the imagined real. Now their analysis will decide my tomorrow for me. But they will never know. But they will never know with what great tenderness grace was bestowed by my forefathers. With what doting love and sacrifice my folks grew me up. How father taught courage to fight challenges and how mother taught to accept them. But they will never know the joy of living in the philosophy of revolt and revolution. The art of being cultured in their innate boast of their culture. But they will never know that the moment I stand, their meetings get dissolved. And when I'm not involved, a new rebellion is born to strike back at them. But they'll never know. Life has been so beautiful and I have no complaints. So uh, this, was, this, is, uh, this was the first poem that I uh, felt I needed to write because uh, uh, this poetry is, uh, you know, uh, I do not know if I have to end up explaining my poetry here, but uh, if you have any queries about this poem, then maybe I can answer that. Or should I proceed to the next one and then take all your queries later? Ma'am, you can proceed and then we'll take it. Okay. My, uh, I'm just going to read out my recent composition. Uh, this is probably going to be anthologized, uh, you know, the, in, in, in an anthology which is uh, specifically, uh, you know, devoted to poetry of descent, so to say. And the title of this poem is Straight Talk. Straight Talk. Let's talk of nation carving inards of its autochthons, martyring guiltless on unceremonious march, stagnant cesspool emanating disease, veinlets diffusing toxicity, arteries choked by discarded sagacity, dreams trampled under ruthless hooves, festering untold oppressive wound. Can you hear me, please? I thought there was a connection problem. Yes, yes. Now it's audible. Yeah. Nation that cannot be nibbled like bread in hunger. Let's talk of nation. Let's talk of bodies waging futile, gruesome battles. Scorched, scrawny, starving bodies. Poverty-stricken, parched, perspiring bodies, exhausted, spectral, promenading bodies, stark, sterile, staring bodies, thrashed, lynched, blood-sucked bodies, dehydrated, decimated, depleted bodies, luscious, voluptuous, adorable bodies, molested, raped, 
mutilated bodies, maimed, burnt, pulverized bodies, blood-soaked, ribbed of parturient bodies, dying nevermore, lactating bodies, bodies torn apart from bodies. Let's talk of bodies. Let's talk of trees, upright, horny, with tufted heads, swinging, tripping by the roadside trees, broken, born, broken trees, raving, storming, turning, sluggish trees, growing on secular soils, hybrid trees, deceptive, tall, green grasses, coddling and turning their back, these trees, feeding on its own fruit, puckered trees, serpentine branches looming in dark alleys, twilight rustling agonized bodies, trees turning into many trees, homing political wannabes, apolitical trees, providing, calculating, analyzing trees, trees tutoring birds to change nests and fly. Let's talk of trees. Let's talk of roads. Roads branching into roads, living and dying and becoming roads, meeting and departing on roads. Roads singing pains exclusively for roads, bearing kinship to roads, fighting solely for roads, roads staking claims on roads, roads bulldozed mythological roads, translucent growing limbs of roads, fostering promises for roads, carving pathways, the rebel roads, exhausted roads coming back to roads, roads embracing roads, for the sake of roads, let's talk of roads. Let's talk of language. Language dismantling the cultural cadaver, smoldering the heat of bygone times, ripping the womb of history, unveiling the voices of ancestors, owning what we know, what we ought to know, not what is wanted to know, slitting tongues that hunt and shrink, chewing the living juices out of grammar, creating lexicon of woeful injustices, pronouncing the syntactic storm, gorging immeasurable silences between words, language reaching out, sentences for love. Let's talk of language. Let's talk of distressed birds, eager to fly of distorted bodies, mothering and daughtering wounds in dark, sheltering words behind muted walls, the nameless ones and the name calling, the classifications, categories and subcategories, token inclusions and silencing, perceptive indifference and indiscreet and discreet truths, heightened altruism of truths. Let's talk of narcissistic eulogies carved in stone, their yellow armory of defense and seasons redolent laughter sowing dynamites in my backyard. Let's talk of living in our skins. Let's talk of living in our skins. Let's talk of my needs. Let's talk of my needs far greater and more urgent than yours. Let's talk of what we could, of what we should, of what we must, but never talk and pretend we talk enough. When we never mean to talk at all, let's talk of bleak and grisly things about bleak and grisly things for the sake of bleak and grisly things. Let's talk 
of real things. Let's talk of real things, the urgency of being real, of becoming real for once, the necessity of getting into real things. Let's talk straight. Let's get talkative like water. My third poem for the day is titled One Evening. One evening to lessen the languor of its exhausted body. The sun descends in the ocean. The night coats its cheeks with scarlet of the sundown. In the world of dreams, the crippled shores of the being are touched by the mesmerized waves. The iced tears then find their way. One evening, wrapped in the limitless storm, stands against me, emblazoned for a bright tomorrow. Thank you. So, uh, these are the three poems I had uh, for the evening. Perhaps one more, uh, you know, uh, the last one, and then uh, we can sort of take a break and then I can move on to my translations. So, this untitled poem, In this wasteland, in this wasteland of dead and impotence, no pole star shines, nor music one hears by the ocean light. No caresses come from the winds, nor lull from the springs. No beauty lingers anymore on lips, nor strength prevails in fists. Young brains rot, old wait for the cycle to complete. In this garden, intellectual sterility like weeds has outgrown trees. Those do not afford a shady recess to the exhausted body. They're selling dreams of this dreamland to the needy. They're selling the dreams of this dreamland to the needy. Yesterday, Skinnery was in full bloom. A full stringed guitar, now one stringed. Tomorrow will be smashed on the branch. In this wasteland, birds are blissfully unaware what the future holds, but a monstrous dawn awaits all. Thank you. Hello, ma'am. Yes, Kavita. Uh, yeah, it yes. Was, uh, what to say? I was listening to you, and uh, what I felt from the first poem, uh, a truth. It is really the truth you have um, put in the pathos and protest of a uh, Dalit in yes. society. Yeah. It's really, you have really depicted the pathos and protest because you have spoken about uh, the philosophy of revolt and revolution in the end. Uh, yeah. You have begun, you have begun with uh, the troubles that yeah. a family holds and how a, a Dalit person, how a Dalit uh, comes, uh, grow up in society, but yeah. is marginalized by the other people, calling mm. them names. And, hmm. and calling them as beneficiaries of government. And finally, yes. yeah, they are sidelined in, in when, whichever or whatever ways they grow up. But yes. finally, the Dalit persons, they are trying to find themselves some sort of philosophy in uh, revolt and revolution. And at the same time, they are finding the beauty of truth in it. And uh, uh, the poet ends with saying that she has no complaints. It life has been beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, life has been really beautiful. But, but this, this is also about, you know, the, uh, uh, you have really caught the vein of, of the pulse of what I was wanting to present. Yeah, being a woman and being a Dalit, of course, is an intrinsic aspect of my being. And it has also shaped my subjectivity, my essence, you know, uh, it has shaped my perception to what I am. But uh, I also wish to mention that uh, uh, my poetry is about humanity, you know, it's endless struggles, both within and, and sort of without. 
you know it's it's it, 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 at times uh, the struggle becomes so immensely complex so it it cannot be sort of discernible like the black and white or you know any such distinguishable uh, distinguishable kind of a striking category or striking kind of a division sometimes yes humanity happens to be dalit you know you see and and so i think um, it also sort of uh, this particular poem that you have uh, spoken of it it speaks uh, for for the wrongs here no doubt but it also speaks for the traps that kind of are being laid to sort of demarcate you to kind of mythicize you a certain way you know uh, to perhaps even to sort of iconize you into proscribed places for that matter you know uh, this is how you are supposed to be this is how your life is supposed to be you know that uh, 10 to 6 uh, your father works in a in a shift and then he gets boozed on his way home how mother struggles you know these are these are the proscribed images uh, uh, that are being built about and you know you are placed into images which are created for you these are not images which you have built you know and therefore uh, letting you know who you are making you feel out of place is also in a way historically situating you into that place they wish to assign you into you see right. and and i think this is where i'm trying to puncture that that notion when i say that life has been beautiful and i have no complaints you know the the ending is is actually debunking this whole mythicization yeah. that uh, goes about with with uh, with the life and it's uh it's here exactly where you kind of no space you know virtually and sort of carve your place rather than sort of find someone else situating you there you are uh you are what you are you know so i think this is you have caught the pulse of of this poem so uh yes ma'am i find this poem as a form of protest itself it is when yes. you say that i have no complaints you are putting up all the troubles that you have undergone so it is in a way a protest this poem is in a way protest and it is uh, actually giving hope for uh, the generations the readers to say that whatever may happen life is so beautiful and you have to uh, go up with that that's true see uh, uh, also it's about you know how these uh, as i said uh, myth making and image building has been part and parcel about the dalit community particularly you are supposed to be dressed up in a certain way you are supposed to be yeah. look uh, looked at in a certain way you are uh, not expected to be articulate you are not expected to be good looking you are you know these are certain sort of uh, it's in a way um, as i said the kind of situatedness that goes with the whole idea of uh, you know first iconizing you then putting you into a slot you know so uh, it's it's some it's it's in a way uh, sort of puncturing that kind of uh, uh, categorization you know uh, that uh, all lives are not the the same you know the the way uh, the the proscribed perception about uh you know that little life can be so it's it's not that and also you know about when you talk of when you keep hearing about you know these two particular days of a year uh that's the jayanti or you know where you get a holiday and then uh how uh, you keep hearing about erratic uh, you know how uh, the, the whole line that goes beneficiaries of governments under but that's the only affirmative action policy that you have in the country unfortunately you know and it's not something like uh, something which is uh, uh, we that that is at the mercy of the government it's something which is which is meant to be and which has not been sort of uh, carried in the way it should have been carried for so many years and that's the reason why you have writers and poets constantly clamoring for for the for the same thing uh, every now and then you know so is there and in the second poem you uh, the poem titan spray talk you talks about the bodies which are torn apart from yes. bodies so yes so this poem is very much relevant in this uh, in today's scenario of farmer yes. strike and so on yes we are yes. speaking about the real bodies the bodies that mm. are exhausted uh, the poverty yes. stricken the blood sucked bodies so yes. how come you write about uh, this poem the context of this poem i uh, i have a whole lot of uh, thing going on you know uh, let me tell you kavita something i have come across several poets you know uh, several several poets uh, uh, absolutely dispassionate 
and deprived of any rationale, I must say. And to, to a large extent, they keep carrying with them these cultural baggages, you know, that they have sort of internalized or inherited from uh, ages of privileged living, uh, so to say. So, uh, in fact, uh, these are the kind of poets who also keep telling you that, you know, they don't have anything to do with politics. They don't have to do anything, you know, they are poets, they are creative people. So they don't have anything to deal with, you know, what, what's happening out there in the, in the world. And uh, they have nothing to do about society, what, what politics goes into it. And, and, and at times, you know, you kind of hear this with a great sense of self-worth that they keep talking about, you know, as though it's a matter of pride for them. That, and these are the very same people uh, who also maintain that they have nothing to do with day-to-day -day politics. But let me tell you that what we eat, what we wear, what we speak, what we deal with, I mean, it's like a daily dose. Politics is like a daily dosage for us. Uh, you, whether you like it or not, you are part of it, you know, or, uh, so it, 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 by just abstaining or by just saying that, you know, I have nothing to do with this, or I have nothing to do with this. I don't think, how can this be really possible? You see, you know, as I said, politics is, is part of our existence today. And, and uh, therefore these poets who keep saying that they have nothing to do with politics, have nothing to do with anything at all, you see. And so I think, uh, the efficacy of what they say or what they write or what they do has to be congent to the times we are living in. You know, it, it really amuses me sometimes to see the kind, the kind of priorities, the kind of uh, non calents you know, some of these poets, the, the kind of gait, the kind of approach they have towards day-to-day, uh, -to -day, uh, uh, you know, life and situations, you know. So uh, I... Uh, on my part, uh, this was more like an outburst for all that was sort of uh, is going around, you know. So we're talking of nation here, we're talking of bodies here, we're talking of trees, you know, who actually should be, uh, uh, you know, reaching out, but trees who have a different role. We're talking of roads, you know, we're talking of language. There are multiple things that sort of uh, have gone into this. So it's, it's this long poem basically is a cluster of several short poems put together um, um, and uh, yeah. Isman, since uh, you have spoken about language uh, in particular in this poem, yeah. uh, can you speak about the language of Dalit poet? Because uh, I have been very much outspoken and fearless, uh, the mm. language that the poets use. Uh, so yeah. uh, can you speak on the use, uh, language use in Dalit poems? Um, see, um, this language that we are talking of definitely has to be different, you know. Uh, it has to be uh, a poetry of difference. Uh, having said that, that I really don't know how different uh, my language would be from any, you know, normal, uh, any other kind of, uh, any person speaking uh, uh, any other language, so to say. So, and personally, if you ask me, uh, I really don't believe in being boxed into into any categories yeah you know uh, as it is there are so many categories and subcategories and you know groups and subgroups even amongst writers forget about academia academia is well known for scratching backs you see uh, but even amongst the writers there are so many so many groups who should go where or who should go to which gathering whether he, he or she should go at all or not it starts from all year. Oh, XYZ is a Marxist, so we don't need to go there. XYZ is an Ambedkarite, so we don't know. I mean, these are the kind of things uh, writers keep, you know, tossing with uh, all, all, all the time. I don't understand why, uh, you know, audience who kind of relish good poetry, audience who enjoy good poetry, I do not understand why we need to segregate them as per these segregations that are already existing in the literary scenario. I mean, let the audience, let the, the, let the avid readers enjoy poetry as it is. You're speaking about language. Language has to be different, no doubt. There has to be some um, spark in it, but uh, you know, kind of uh, creating a distinction between my language and their language. I don't know how, uh, you know, uh, how far this, this sort of uh, uh, goes, uh, you know, how far this holds uh, substance. Because ultimately, you are you are using a language where you are communicating. You know, you're using a language where you're reaching out. As long as you reach out, 
it uh, it's all that matters you know uh, but definitely uh, you know i i have been uh, uh, i've been listening to people who speak of their language as being sanskritized our language as being why do we make these distinctions at all language is language you mold it whichever way and language is one of the most flexible uh, you know it's it's one of the most uh, flexible uh, entities that you can have really you can mold the language the way you want to uh, as per your your choice if there's a certain kind of life you have lived speak out from that language nobody stops you from that nobody stops you from that kind of an articulation but you know when you say this is sanskritized english and this is dalit english i think we are we are we are getting confused there so uh, we should bar those confusions language is language we use whichever language uh, we wish to articulate ourselves in uh, what is important is verbalizing what you have uh, you know what you need to and uh, reaching out that's what i feel personally okay ma'am so ma'am uh, actually dalit poetry when we speak about dalit poetry in particular mm. it is mm. uh, a socially committed poetry yes the socially committed poetry so uh, do you distinguish your own poems like uh, socially committed poem and your own personal or emotional poems like as a mm. woman you might be feeling something personal to write about mm. so uh, you will be uh, do you write or do you distinguish your own poems as socially committed poem or uh, one my personal poem um see uh, when you are talking about social commitment your personal has to become political there is no two way about it you see and unless that happens with a sensitive sensitized individual poetry doesn't make any sense we are living in times of flux and we cannot talk of leaves flowers trees and all that kind of glorious romanticization uh, of the wordsworthian era you know our poetry has uh, different uh, directions to take uh, it has to be evocative it has to be um, emotive it has to be evocative it has to uh, be communicable and uh, therefore yes social commitment bereft of social commitment i don't think any uh, poet should at least in times that we live in uh you know it it really necessitate necessitates the whole urge to write poetry which is full of commitment uh how else should poetry be you know maybe it it may be overtly covertly you know it, it all it, it's it's the approach of the poet whether one wants to sort of uh, uh articulate it more vociferously or to sort of trail the a more gentler you know path more gentler uh, whether there has to be a more gentler tonal aspect to it i think whether it has to be more communicated in a more subtle way i think it's it's all on individual writer to deal with but i think uh, what is personal has to be political not otherwise uh, you know yes thank you ma'am uh, deepak i think there are questions in the chat box can you just read it out Oh, ma so ma'am. Um, so yeah, Triparna Banerji asks, uh, "Ma'am, uh, in your poem which talks about the bodies waging war, the uh, mm. bodies, uh, depleted bodies, is there a juxtaposition of life and death being personified to a certain extent to uh, adumbrate existentialism?" My uh, obviously, <laughs> there has to be there. It, see, uh, as a poet, uh, this. angst this existential angst has to be part of uh, uh, my my being and uh, uh, the what i would in fact put the question back to you what do you feel when you heard me reading it out what was your impression uh, tripar uh, sorry uh, yeah triparna probably you could switch on the audio and respond to that Hello, yes. ma'am. Uh, hello, hello, Triparna. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, yes, you are. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, having read your poem, I really did feel that uh, there seems to be a sort of an existential touch. Uh, firstly, I would say, ma'am, I did find your poetry to be a bit allegorical. Okay. A bit alleg allegorical, since it carries a sort of a hidden moral and political message. and secondly ma'am i felt that there seems to be a sort of an existential touch and 
reading your poems reminded me of Eliot, T.S. Eliot okay. very much. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, ma'am, I thought that, ma'am, when you were talking about uh, the bodies, uh, yes. it struck me, what struck me the most is that since we all, you know, come up, ma'am, with a lot of challenges and difficulties in life, mm -hmm. we undergo certain uh, changes in life uh, with respect to people or human beings from all walks of life. And that mm -hmm. made me like that whether your poetry that has to do with the bodies whether it does personify uh, life and death and thereby adumbrating existentialism yes uh, Triparda, to a large extent because when i talk of bodies waging futile gruesome battles it's about the the day-to-day -day struggles i mean talk about the migrants during the lockdown the kind of uh, you know pathos we have been witness to you know, uh, people dying of hunger on the on the road, you know, stark, sterile, staring bodies, when I say exhausted, spectral, promenading bodies. Yes, I had all this at the back of my mind, poverty stricken, parched, perspiring bodies. Yes, um, you know, dehydrated, decimated, depleted bodies. And who does this? This whole consumeristic culture in a way, you know, the, the kind of uh, capital, you know, the, the, uh, we live in this uh, capitalist uh, kind of uh, economy where the common man has, uh, where uh, the common man's body is no body at all, you see. And so, you know, and then talking of molested, raped, mutilated bodies, of course, uh, a lot, a whole lot of it. Yes, there is this whole, uh, as you rightly put it, uh, it, it is allegorical to a large extent and there is my uh, my existential you know uh, there is this angst which i'm trying to present bodies torn apart from bodies so you know there's this uh, the whole lot of there, there's this gender dimension that comes in there are a whole lot of things that come up with uh, you know uh, when i talk of bodies when i say let's talk of bodies this particular poem ma'am it's uh, something that has to do with the current scenario as well Yes, and yes, it has to. Yes, that much. that definitely had. A, I had that at the back of my mind when I was writing this. Yes, yes. ma'am. Love your poem. Some thank you, ma'am, for explaining. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so, um, in fact, the list host of questions that we received from the participants prior to the session. Uh, hmm. Like, let me begin with one one query that some of them had asked. In the sense, uh, they they you know, I think they are from your place, I don't know, uh, they wish to read your short stories. And they were wondering where could they get your short stories from? I think in they fact, searched right? because it's in the local language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, it is. It, they are in Marathi. And yeah. uh, we are working on the translations, Deepak, very shortly. Uh, that should be uh, in public domain. But uh, these short stories are in Marathi and they'll come out uh, very soon in English translation. So. Yeah, that much I can uh, assure. Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, thank you, ma'am. And then uh, coming back to your poems, uh, like, what is it that uh, took you to poetry, uh, if I may ask? Uh, your your first poem, mm. how was mm. it born? Uh, and when is that that you felt poetry is a... Because I, I realized that you write short story, you do a lot of translation. When is it that you felt that I need to express myself through I have been basically a poet to tell you my journey began way back when I was nine years old when uh, there's this uh, daily called Lokmat. Unfortunately, now it has uh, changed, uh, uh, you know, uh, hands. It used to be a very uh, secular, <laughs> this uh, word which one has to use very cautiously these days. So it used to be a very, uh, you know, well-read newspaper or a magazine that used to come, the Sunday magazine. So repeatedly, this uh, poem, the first poem that I had written was in Marathi. And it was uh, repeatedly published uh, for three consecutive, uh, uh, you know, uh, I should say weeks. Um, and uh, I was nine. My journey began then, obviously. But then, uh, of course, uh, uh, times, you know, when you're born of a well-known mother, Sometimes uh, you and your uh, your essence uh, tends to get uh, uh, subdued. I mean, people uh, look at you as the daughter of somebody, you know. So there was a hiatus, I must say, you know, a, a, a hiatus as far as my poetic composition went. Of course, I'd been sending it here and there and 
you know uh, but yeah that's that's how it uh, it started and, uh, been writing maybe not very consistently but poetry has always been my forte in fact i enjoy teaching poetry to my students at iplu so uh, yes that's exactly where the question came from uh, i was wondering what's the experience of an expected poet right from the day you were born you are expected to be a literary uh, like scholar kind of a person so um, yeah that is where that sprang up from and uh, in the context uh, pungurili asked what kind of themes do you think still needs to be spoken about uh, regarding dalit literature i think uh, it has to be more experimentative now it has to come out of that uh, uh, there's a certain mold that uh, Uh, and let me clarify this i as i mentioned you know it's it's a uh, uh, as a poet i don't like to be boxed uh, into categories as a, as a dalit poet or you know uh, but as i said that being dalit of course is is an intrinsic aspect or part about me which is undeniable but you know not all of my poetry is about being that you see uh, my poetry happens to be about humanity about people you know people who matter about things that matter and at times uh, uh, that that becomes part of my uh, my be you see my uh, at times humanity as i said happens to be the other so uh, it's it's from that angle that i i kind of look at it so not that i you know i write uh, in a certain mold or assume a certain pose when i write you know it's uh, uh, i don't do it i don't do it i mean and i think uh, poets also should avoid writing for social fashion you know because uh, you are born a certain way that you need to write in a certain way i don't think that should be the the approach uh, honestly uh, i think uh, that that poetry has to be more experimentative more explorative and uh, it has to sort of somewhere uh, hark back to to uh, to folk origins that kind of experimentation i think has not happened so far so going back to the folk roots the way it has happened with black literature for instance you know where you have them experimenting with blues and jazz and you know uh, and all of that and that becomes part of of uh, black poetry so that vigorously i don't think it has happened when it comes to dalit writing which should happen because uh, you know uh, again then the question comes uh, whether dalit writing has that kind of uh, you know cultural baggage so to say to fall back upon you know the way the blacks uh, you know had their uh, had their folk uh, roots you know uh, they had the oral idiom which they of course carried across the atlantic and sort of experimented along uh, that's another question whether they but then i think that's that's where exactly the poet needs to decipher to to sort of read to sort of uh, there there have been rich traditions which have not been written about first thing is of course uh, history has always been so biased we all know that and it, it it's been written by a few people uh, you know with a certain perspective with a certain pose uh, so of course there have been traditions which have probably not been spoken of so this is where the the poet needs to research and work so um, writing poetry you know just for the for the sake of because you are born a certain way and you have to sort of put it across and then you assume the garb and that you know you throw down this revolutionary gauntlet and all i don't subscribe to that kind of uh, you know approach really uh, i think poetry uh, for me has to be much more than it has to move transcend these uh, you know things now it's it's time and i think the younger poets are doing that uh, perhaps uh, you know Okay, um, so in fact, I uh, hand over to Kavita, ma'am. Um, okay, ma'am, uh, let me ask you on a personal note: How far yeah. your mother has inspired you as a poet? Um, well, she has been a drilling ground, a training ground for not just me but many like me. Let me tell you, apart from this uh, blood kinship that we share, she was more like a companion to me. You know, in fact, I was her first critic. and she would be you know it would it, it would be vice versa you no know? like uh, i would read out my compositions to her and she would sort of critique it or you know appreciate it or you know whatever and that used to be so more than that you know uh, of course uh, she was this very beautiful woman who 
uh, she was a remarkable uh, woman, a remarkable poet who happened to be my mother. I must say that way. I must put it that way. But, you know, uh, apart from that, you know, apart from this personal relationship, we had this relationship of, uh, of uh, companionship, of sisterhood, let me put it, you know. Uh, it's a very, uh, again, a very uh, tricky term to use these days, especially in the era of uh, uh, feminism, post-feminism and all of that. But it, it was a different kind of uh, bonding. And as I said, to me and people like me, she was a drilling ground, a training ground. Her poetry was not just evocative. Uh, it would not just excite you, but it would incite you, you know. Namdev Dasal, Jyoti Lanjewad, these are the kind of poets one looks up to every now and then. They're like those uh, touchstones uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, Dalit literary writing. So, uh, and also one more thing, Kavita, I would like to tell you that her poetry was not restricted to a particular group, caste, community, you know, she didn't believe in being boxed either. So I, this is what I sort of inherited from her perhaps. Uh, or my, you know, association with her uh, made me sort of emulate from her. I think uh, it, it, her poetry was so broad, it embraced humanity. The toiling laborer, the, the landless farmer, women, Dalit, Adivasi, women. It would cut across uh, race, caste, you know, gender. It, it, it would transcend all these boundaries to sort of embrace humanity to, to a large extent. And therefore, you know, when, when we talk about her poetry, it sort of needs to be analyzed in this uh, broader matrix of social transformation rather than putting it into a box and saying this poetry is so-and-so or this is so-and-so. Because see, social transformation is not something for one particular community or caste or uh, religion, you see. It's, it's meant for all. Because when we talk of transformation, self-transformation, we are also talking of transforming the other person. You know, it's a reciprocative process. It's not, it's not just one way. And therefore, uh, to me, her poetry uh, becomes a paradigm of social change. And social change, which is not just one way, because in your change, you're also, you know, conscientizing the other in, in that sense. And, uh, and so uh, for people like me, she was, she was I must say, uh, a drilling ground, a training ground, you know. They have, it's not just me, and perhaps this was the thing that I had in mind when I was translating her volume, Red Slogans on the Green Grass. Uh, when I translated this, it was not because she happened to be my mother, but she happens to be one of the poets I admired the most, along with Namdev Dasal and others, you know. So, uh, and I think um, uh, what is also interesting about her poetry, since now that you have broached the subject, I feel... Uh, uh, when you look at her, her, her whole, her, her poetic, uh, you know, world, her worldview, you find that she embraced all those processes, all those ideological forces, flows that sort of kept the oppressed at the center stage, that had the oppressed humanity at the, at the, at the center, you know. And so you find her aligning herself with progressive writers, and she was part of the progressive writers uh, uh, group. And, um, you know, uh, she was, uh, as I said, she never, uh, uh, she, she tried to sort of align herself with all those um, like-minded individuals, perhaps who believed in social change, who believed in human progress, who perhaps believed in the good of humanity. She tried to embrace them all. And that's why I find her a very important uh, you know, uh, quality about her, not just as an individual, but as a poet, is that she's loved and respected across boundaries, you know. She's not boxed into one category. You have, you know, when, when we uh, actually, uh, uh, some of the progressive writers and, you know, poets, when we got together in, in Maharashtra, in Vidarbha, and we founded a Pratishthan after her demise, you know, it's been seven years, we have been organizing programs in continuation. We recently had one online. Uh, you know, uh, it was with this perspective in mind that she uh, represents a very broader canvas, you know, so uh, not just, uh, it's not about one particular group or one particular community, it's about humanity, you see, at large, and all those ideological forces that align themselves, that believe in the good of humanity, she tried to, uh, you know, align herself with all those. And therefore, I, I feel that her, her works have to be looked um, in, the, in this broader matrix of uh, social transformation, social change, 
and uh, you know uh, yeah that's that's what i have to say about it okay ma'am uh, yeah. ma'am uh, are you reading out some of your translations i wouldn't mind but the only thing is uh, it's in this phone in this uh, i'll just try to uh, open the uh, the file uh, uh you may not be able to see me perhaps but then uh in fact i as i said i'm uh, you know i don't have anything uh, with me but fortunately i had sent the file folder to one poet in uh, pune uh, very recently who was to uh, you know speak about her and and all of that so it's in my cell phone i'll just try to see how it works just give me a minute can you still see me kavita uh no ma'am No, you are not visible. Yeah. Ah, uh, but then you know I need to read. Uh, so is that okay if you don't see me? Yeah, it's okay. Perfect. Yeah, it's okay, ma'am. Yeah? Uh, it's okay. Unfortunately, I am not uh, well equipped since I am here in Calcutta and not uh, well equipped here. I've been trying to uh, work it out through the laptop, but it didn't work. So, um, all right. I'll read out a few of my translations. Um, this is of course uh, uh, a translation that i had done in 2008 2009 one very popular poem of of hers of dr jyoti lanjewars and uh, uh, this is about a working class mother this is about a dalit mother about a mother who you know uh, who struggles slogs to see that the next generation uh doesn't have uh, you know to bear the burden of of all those uh, struggles that she has Uh, sort of bone and uh, so it's a very very touching uh, portrayal and this poem first was translated by uh, you know uh, it was it was uh, part of the uh, anthology of dalit uh, literature which was edited by mulkraj anand and elinar zeliet and later of course uh, there have been many translations of this poem in, in almost all the major indian languages including uh, you know uh, some foreign languages too Uh, this is my translation of course of the poem uh, it's titled i never saw you i'm sorry you may not be able to see my video because i'm reading this from my mobile phone mm. that's okay ma'am okay all right so I never saw you I never saw you in a newly brought brilliant brocaded nine yard irkali sari metal necklace adorned or gold bracelets worn not even rubber sandals on your feet ma I saw you burning your souls in the scorched heat hanging your abdomens tender shoot bundled on the acacia tree carrying wax of tar amidst the construction crew repairing roads i saw you rags tied to your feet planting a sweaty kiss to the naked child trottingly running to you pacifying the yearnings of your starved entrails writhing in agony aiding to build a dam on the lake working on daily wages slaving laboriously i saw you monsoon in your eyes summer burning forever unloading the sun from upon your head picking cotton elegantly placing in your shredded shoulder cloth prune i beg your pardon i'll have to do this again monsoon in your eyes summer burning forever unloading the sun from upon your head picking cotton elegantly placing in your shredded shoulder cloth pruning the unyielding land flowing behind the plow building the future of bantlings i saw you balancing the basket load in crowded lanes 
wrapping your tattered sari's end, guarding your honor, raising your chappal. At anyone who leered at you, I saw you. For a dream of mud plastered four walls, your feet heavy with pregnancy, advertently stepping the scaffolding of a tall building, carrying on your head scuttles of wet cement. I saw you untying your sari's end in late evenings for coins, bringing oil and salt for cooking. Putting a five paisa coin on your little one's hand and saying, eat whatever goodies with it, but go to school. Tenderly holding by the breast, the little bundle from the cradle and saying, at least you study, become like Ambedkar and relieve me of the loaded baskets of labor. I saw you, steps dragging you to your little nest, faggots of the body, web of living, returns to the money lender, a plowshare, your dawn and night, half fed stomach, yet refusing a gratis, unearned for, retaining your dignity to the core. I saw you sauntering ahead on the long march and sloganing. Renaming has to be done, braving the police batons, head held high, going to the jail, seeing your only son martyred in police firing, pacifying. You died for Bhima. Your life got its meaning. Telling the police officer defiantly how good it would have been if I had four sons more. They would have fought as well. I saw you. I saw you on your deathbed, stealing the precious last moments of life, donating to Diksha Bhumi the money earned and saved from rag picking, reiterating, live in unity, you all, build a memorial, fight for Baba's name, breathing your last Jaibim, I saw you. I never saw you in newly brought, brilliant, brocaded, nine yard, Irkali Sari. Now, uh, for those of you uh, who, uh, you know, this, this, of course, these are certain region specific words, you know, and it's very, very difficult to translate them. Irkali is a kind of a heavy brocaded nine yard Sari, of course. And uh, the references that you have certain historical references, for instance, a long march, which was actually the march taken by several followers of Ambedkar. Uh, that began in Nagpur and it ended in Aurangabad for the renaming of the Maratwada University in the name of Ambedkar. So it, 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 there are references to that. And, uh, you know, then there is uh, 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 there's uh, uh, Diksha Bhumi, which is a place in Nagpur and it's considered really sacred by the followers of Ambedkar. And it was here that uh, Ambedkar, along with lakhs of his followers, embraced Buddhism for its uh, egalitarian approach. But it was also more as a mark of revolt against the caste Hinduism that had sort of enslaved and given uh, the untouchables lowly treatment for centuries. So, you know, there are all these historical references in this particular poem. But moreover, it's, it's a very, very, you know, uh, realistic depiction of, of a working mother, you know, who is telling the child, you know, uh, she's earning whatever she earns, you know, from her daily labor, the two little pennies she's uh, entrusting it in the, in the tiny hands of a child and telling him, eat whatever goodies you can, but, you know, you become like Ambedkar and so on. So I think this, this is a very touching poem. And, uh, and of course, yet another one is Mother of this Motherland. I like this particularly, again, because... Uh, uh, this was originally written as Janani Janamabhumi, and I have titled this it as Mother of this Motherland. So this is the second uh, translation I'm reading out. Mother, to me, your tattered sari's end is as dear as the national flag. Mother, to me, your tattered sari's end 
is as dear as the national flag. The vermilion mark of your forehead accords semblance to the Ashok Chakra. The mountains of your dreams, prodigious than the tall Himalayas. Your self-respect bears the soaring wings of an eagle. The blotches of your forehands sound an alarm for freedom. The deep trench furrows of your face flash the constitution of this nation. The unfathomed deeps of your eyes aspire the country's parliament. The shaft corrugation of your feet, the Sachivale of Mumbai. Your toil-worn body exudes infelicity of ages. The jagged contours of your palms, the emblem of an empire. The forceful embroisia of your words unsavors the Vedas and Puranas. The lexicon of your woes earmarks the greatest epic poem. The blues sung by your parched voice stand taller than the national anthem. The countless hurts endured lie wheeled in your insolate lips. Mother, you are the root culture of this land. Yet, your steed sojourns the periphery. You have sweated to raise the golden grains. Yet, this land has kept you undernourished. You are the mother of this motherland. Then why, then why is this land deficient for you? That's the question she ends with. The third one. Yes, Kavita. Yes, go ahead. I uh, know, ma'am. I was about to comment on the poem, which is mm. on motherhood. Yeah. Yeah, it is a very strong poem on... It's a Dalit. very strong one. Yeah. Yeah, very strong poem on Dalit mothers who sacrifice their life entirely yes. for the family. Yes, So true. they are the ones who work hard for the family yes. uh, more than uh, the fathers. So true. unlike the upper caste uh, women, we can always see Dalit women working all these uh, hard toiling works. And, yes, yes. Uh, uh, and to say, ma'am, uh, in... In that, that poem, uh, mm. there is reference to Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Yes, yes. Uh, she has referred to the long march, then the Diksha, yes. the Diksha, Diksha Bumi, Bumi. And, so, and so on. Um, yes, so yes, yes. Uh, what we see uh, during those times is that uh, Dalit women were actively engaged in Dalit movements. Yes, yes, true. Do you think Dalit women today are that much involved in these Dalit movements? I don't see any movements, Kavita, <laughs> unfortunately. No. Where are the movements? You tell me, show me. Uh, Ma'am, uh, there is one jail bharo uh, movement going on now in which Dalits are also involved. But do uh, do we have any Dalit woman leader to uh, lead? Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think um, much of Dalit writing today, I'm sorry to say this, is pandering to marketable norms. And uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, much of those writers who were uh, revolutionary or are uh, seen on social media promoting their works, you know, promoting their writings. So movement as such, I don't know where uh, it has gone. Of course, uh, I'm not giving you a very pessimistic, uh, you know, uh, view of, of the whole scenario, but I'm not optimistic either. Uh, let me tell you that. Because, uh, uh, you know, uh, see, they're uh, speaking in terms of uh, uh, Dalit feminism, uh, speaking in terms of Dalit women writing. Uh, I think... Uh, there's this one approach which has to be understood very clearly and categorically that Dalit feminism is not about uh, Dalit male bashing, you see. Uh, it, it's not about sort of uh, lashing out at the, the, the male patriarchy or male hegemony because somewhere uh, at the end of the whole uh, thing, uh, the dynamics is that he suffered and so she suffered too. And um, any, any struggle uh, without active cooperation of the men 
cannot be a struggle uh, for, for real emancipation. So Dalit women don't look at their struggle in isolation. You have to understand that. Uh, but unfortunately, when, when you read a few, uh, few of the writers who uh, speak about Dalit patriarchy, I'm not saying, I'm not denying that it doesn't exist. It does. But to what extent it needs to be highlighted? Who are the translators? Who are doing it? What is their purpose? What is their job? What is the politics behind these translations? I think we also need to sort of constantly question that. Uh, does it really absolve the upper caste, uh, uh, you know, uh, upper caste men from uh, the wrongs they have committed by just showing the SEMA side of Dalit patriarchy? Does it sort of completely absolve what, the, what for centuries the upper caste men have been doing? Who are these uh, translators? What is their role? What is what is their purpose? You know, I think there are a lot of things that you know you keep uh, questioning when when you. So uh, honestly, um, Dalit writing should not be just about male bashing, Dalit male bashing, because ultimately this struggle has to be unitedly fought. Uh, you know, for uh, that the, the the you know the the male discourses do not give much space to women is an undeniable fact. You know that that cannot be uh, denied. But the approach of what the approach of the women has to be, I think that has to be very uh, clearly uh, set forth, which I don't see uh, honestly. Uh, I have been writing extensively on on uh, on these writings. My book, which Rutledge has brought out, uh, there's this huge, uh, enormous uh, uh, article, you know, on on all of these aspects. You know, I kind of uh, take recourse to black writing, and then I talk about uh, Dalit writing and so on. So I think uh, this uh, these aspects have to be taken into consideration. You know, you uh, yeah. I don't know whether I was answering your question. I was just talking of what I felt very strongly about. Yeah, these ideas are welcome, ma'am. What your opinion is welcome. Yeah, so, Deepak, uh, is there any other question? I, I like to ask a question. Yeah, Chandra. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so my, my question was, you know, uh, we often talk about Dalit literature from outside of Maharashtra because mm. Maharashtra is like the leader. So like Marathi, yes. Dalit literature is like the, you know. It started again. there. Yeah, it, yeah, it began exactly. there. That was also the, the base yeah. of Ambedkar's whole movement. Yeah. Maharashtra was the base for Ambedkar's uh -huh. movement. So obviously it started there. And then, of course, it proliferated to the rest of the country. And it's becoming very, very vibrant elsewhere also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I generally see that, uh, you know, post the 1970s, maybe the contemporary mm. Dalit youngsters or whoever, uh, that kind of literature hasn't really emerged. You know, mm. uh, compared to that of the 1970s or like, you know, the uh, mm. Namdeo Dasal or uh, Jyoti Lanjeva generation. Yes. Yeah. What could be the reason, you know, you, you're still being a poet and an academic and somebody who has seen, you know, mm. various voices, mm. uh, mushroom, mm. uh, you know, uh, nowadays, like, you know. Mm. Uh, see, there can be many, very many reasons for, for this. Firstly, the times are not the same, uh, Chandra. Uh, mm. Every poet, kind of every writer tends to uh, contextualize, you know, and uh, uh, revisit uh, his, her peripheralia at best. And uh, so I think uh, those were vibrant times. Th those were the first generation writers who had so much to speak about, you know. Uh, I don't say that there is, you know, the speaking is done. That's why I keep straight talking, you know, my poem is about straight talking. It's not that it's it's done completely, but maybe uh, writers, as I was saying, you know, I was talking about how these categories have emerged and subcategories have emerged. Priorities are different, you see. Each uh, writer is busy sort of um, expanding uh, uh, himself or herself. Each, each one seems to be having their own agenda and each one seems to be moving with that agenda. Even those who uh, so-called, uh, you know, Panthers or those who was, uh, you know, somewhere associated with this uh, first generation, you see them promoting works, you see them uh, talking about their translations, you see them uh, wanting to get translated and so on. And which is natural because also it, it uh, gives you a wider audience, it takes you to a larger audience, that is understandable. But uh, somehow there is a kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
I, I I don't know how to how to put it, but yes, the the scenario seems a little grim. Not that uh, everything has been uh, settled and all the uh, you know um, uh, you know people are happy and uh, and and uh, I think people are just satiated somehow. And I think unless they come out of that that slug, you know that that kind of satiation um, and uh, articulate themselves more uh, vehemently. Uh, which they have stopped doing. I don't know what the reason is, what the the purpose is, what the cause is. You know, you find writers, they have written one, two, three works and that's it. You know, beyond that, there's nothing substantial that has really come out. Uh, so I think this, this is really a matter of, uh, matter to ponder upon. You know, I may not have any uh, direct answers to this. Uh, I, I myself keep wondering as to what what really has happened. I mean, you know, that spark, that that whole thing, you know, which you saw with Jyoti Lanjewa and Namdev Dasal, that is somehow yes, there is a uh, it, it's missing, and uh, there are many very many reasons perhaps you know why uh, which can be uh, given, you know, but there's no one particular reason that I can really give you. Here. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, and. Uh... Alamu Abi, who is an MPhil researcher in Dalit translated autobiographies, uh, mm. she, she says, I found still the marginalization, the violence against Dalit uh, is there, and it's more in northern parts of India than south. And she mm -hmm. wants to know your observation on this regard. Um. My observation is Dalit marginalization is everywhere, not just in South India, North India, Western, it's everywhere. And it's, uh, uh, it's, it's getting more complex. As I was mentioning that it's not a struggle which is like the blacks in America, black and white. It's not a biological you know, pig, a, a matter of pigmentation that you show that this is black and this is white. It's on a very, very complex uh, level. Why, uh, if the Dalit is, uh, has progressed, then why he has progressed? If a Dalit is wearing good clothes, then why is he wearing good clothes? If the Dalit is articulating well, speaking good English, then why is he or she speaking good English? It starts from all of there, you know. So I was talking to Kavita about, you know, rather than you placing yourself, you are already being situated in a certain box. You are already being mythicized. That's where the Dalit writer should explore these myths. That's where the role of the writer comes. You know, you need to debunk. You need to puncture these, you know, status quoist. Uh, so-called forces that keep you boxed in a certain category and want you to see they love to see you that way is that also you know sort of fulfills their hidden you know on one side there'll be extreme eulogy of let's say um, uh, a certain autobiography because it lashes out against Dalit patriarchy but it is also time to question how relevant it is to eulogize such works because you know, Dalit writing originates from community. There is this communal feel to it. It is not, this writing doesn't happen in isolation. It is, it is purposeful. It is purposeful. There, there is an honest commitment and there should be an honest commitment to it. It's not some kind of slogan mongering which people think about it, you see. It, it, it has a certain purpose. It has a certain direction. But that is upon the writer to, to take that writing towards that direction rather than getting misdirected. There are people out there, you know, they will translate your works, they will eulogize your works because it lashes out against patriarchy, but does it really absolve the upper caste man from the burden of what, you know, has happened for so long? Does it absolve the upper caste woman for uh, being an accomplice with him? for centuries together in oppressing the Dalit woman? That is my question. So when we are looking at these texts, we also need to look at these hidden agendas. You know, We need to question the, 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 the efficacy of what is presented. And ultimately autobiographies, I don't know how long they are, you know, uh, my personal take on that is uh, not too many things are brought out, you see. Uh, it's what the writer chooses to tell you. And it's what the reader wishes to absorb, you see. So it, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it, as uh, being, uh, you know, uh, uh, there should be fidelity to truth and, you know, all those beautiful uh, rhapsodic um, sentences and phraseologies that go with uh, uh, 
uh, what an autobiography should be or a memoir should be. I don't think they are like that. You know, some of these autobiographies, um, my analysis, perhaps maybe uh, I can share with you uh, some of my writings. Uh, and uh, I would love it if you sort of analyze them and read them. My analysis has been, uh, yes, the Dalit male autobiographies have not given enough space to the women that I do admit. And therefore, uh, women writings uh, do have an edge over the male autobiographical tradition because they are not even, not just giving space to men in their works, but they're also talking about themselves, you know, and articulating themselves. But in the process, there is somewhere, uh, you know, a kind of line of demarcation that needs to be drawn uh, as to how much you need to lash out, uh, uh, you know, uh, are you some way pandering to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, the, to the whims or the demands of those same people uh, you know, who putting you in a box uh, when you're talking about your men outrightly, openly, you know, lashing out against them. I think these are questions we need to ask ourselves. And uh, Odinia uh, asked, uh, this is, no, she, she's just commenting. This is indeed mm -hmm. an interesting session. I perceive the glorification of motherhood in the poems you just read. The poem is yeah. mainly so emotional. That's what she said. She's from yeah. the Nigeria. And okay. uh, so, um, like in this context, like I, yeah. I was also observing that in most of these poems that you were speaking of, <laughs> and definitely there were also references to these um, uh, seminal historical events. Yes, yes, context, yes. I would like to ask you uh, or mm. take the focus to something else, something that mm. uh, uh, especially people of Kerala was like continuously mm. listening over these over nine, 2019 especially probably because mm -hmm. we are more, we are more bound within the four walls the the, mm -hmm. I, the, the, uh, the trouble with the honor killing okay and in fact i was having a conversation with a friend of mine last week and he was asking me uh, deepak why is it that uh, only men the men get killed uh, in kerala uh, like mostly so are the cases so I, I told him it's also an issue with the patriarchal society. So when it's like a Dalit woman marrying an upper caste person, then it's like, okay, okay, uh, that's fine. She's anyway second to the man. So it's like, fine. But then when, when it comes to a man being Dalit and uh, uh, marrying a, like an upper class woman, um, mm -hmm. it becomes an issue. Even in a place like Kerala, I am stressing on that for the fact that it is said to be the uh, highly literate plays and all that. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, have you uh, shed your light, like the thoughts on such a line in your poems or uh, probably in your writings? And what is your observation on that regard? We have been uh, going into discussion on the capitalist influence in Dalit writings and all that. So in that context, I would like to listen to your observation on this regard. Uh, you mean on honor killing and all of yes. that? Yes, yes. Well, um, see, that's precisely what uh, the. So just, just before uh, you could answer, you know, I'd like to make a small remark. So there was an incident like this in which, you know, do, uh, uh, you know the father of an uh, inter caste married couple, the uh, father of the woman who happens to be OBC, you know, OBC is just about mm. Dalit, uh, happened to kill mm. uh, his daughter, that is the uh, bride. <laughs> On the mm. uh, on the day before the wedding, there was an incident like this, mm. you know. So it, it won't mm. come under, uh, it won't be like punished under Atrocities Act because the victim is a OBC woman killed by her own father. Mm. And there yeah, are other I'm, cases, where, yeah, yeah. So where, where the woman uh, has suffered, like for for you know, daring to marry outside of her caste, even though he's okay. she's like probably OBC or maybe upper caste. Yeah. Well, uh, this conversation is just getting into a lot of. Uh, ah, okay, okay, okay. No, no, I, I just no, made no. a remark. No, no, now it's, that, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. No, no. Now Deepak, that yeah. uh, since uh, yeah. Deepak has also uh, yeah, asked, yeah. Uh, of course, uh, th this would be a little uh, off the uh, uh, hook, and uh, I would be commenting on something which uh, is uh, yes, it's a social evil, a social problem, and. Uh, I think the very important uh, the thing about uh, what uh, about demolishing these caste barriers uh, uh, that Ambedkar sort of enunciated that he put forth was uh, intercaste marriages. That was one important aspect, one important thing he had. 
propounded that, you know, this is one way by which you can sort of, but uh, all along that you find are uh, the pyramid like structure that we have the Indian caste structure where at, this, at the top you have the Brahmin and, you know, and all of the others and then beneath there the Shudras and the Ati Shudras, you know, the, the untouchables, all the others up there on the ladder. Uh, probably have they feel they feel or perhaps they feel it uh, it's their birthright to sort of oppress and marginalize the one who is there at the the bottom so uh, it's not just the one on top of the ladder the brahmin this we and we are not hitting we are not talking about brahmin as an evil i'm not talking of that it's the ism it's the uh, you know, it's the mindset that that is dangerous, that is pernicious. And Brahminism may not necessarily be in the Brahmins themselves. It flows in that, you know, step by step uh, progression. It, uh, it comes down, it, it percolates down there to the lowest rung. So anybody and everybody who is above there in this whole pyramid like kind of structure that you have feels it there, uh, you know, privilege to oppress the one who is there at the at the bottom. So I do hit at this kind of Brahminism, this Brahminical mindset that we have. And it is everywhere. It's in politics, it's in academia, it's amongst writers. Um, as I was telling you, who should go where, who should, you know, talk where, whether they should go at all or not go, you know, oh, if, if, if she goes there, she's a Marxist, or if she goes there, she's an Ambedkar. We are we very conveniently slot people into into groups i mean what is the harm of sort of coming together what is the harm of aligning yourself with all those progressive ideologies who believe in 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 placing the the common man at the center whether it is ambedkar or whether it's marx or whether i mean ultimately ambedkar's ideology draws a lot from western philosophy you know one cannot forget that and so so segregating him and uh, this is what the lit ideagogues or literators who call themselves so uh, do many a times. And this is the blunder they should stop committing now. Uh, about this honor killing part and all, it also tells you the kind of systematic internalization that has you know gone on. You know, people have only advanced materially, but their mindset is still ancient. You know, they're they're still tied up to those same traditions. Uh, you know, uh, the same uh, kind of uh, approach towards uh, uh, this whole notion of pollution and you know uh, thing which is pollution and non-pollution and so on it's just, it's keeps playing on people's minds so i don't think uh, uh, you know uh, uh, progressive thoughts have reached out there and i don't know uh, as long as you know we don't have a, a very secular kind of a setup in this country as long as there'll be continued polarization in the name of religion caste uh, these things are going to get aggravated day by day. They are not going to stop, I feel, you know. And uh, this is my observation. I mean, uh, so I think uh, a lot depends on the governance. A lot depends on how these laws which have been framed are, uh, you know, active, uh, actively implemented. Uh, a, a lot depends on, on how these affirmative action policies that we have had, uh, what, you know, how they are, uh, what role they are playing in sort of keeping such incidents, uh, you know, at, at bay. I think all these things, uh, but the, the fact that they are happening tells you the failure of, of this whole uh, big, huge talk that we talk of, you know, secular democratic state and all of that as a complete, uh, you know, false notion. And that some are equal and some are more equal. It's the Orwellian kind of uh, state of affairs that we, we still find. And uh, yes, so uh, it's a very utopian kind of thing to say that when this stops, this is, I think it's a process. It's, it's, a, it's a very, and uh, uh, you know, uh, what has been internalized, what has been ingrained for ages, it's not going to sort of evaporate just like this, you see. It will take its time it will have its consequences it will have its repercussions but yes it will be a slow process it, it may let's hope that it should sort of uh, a very educated uh, state like kerala if something like this a migrant uh, you know a, a man is killed in day broad daylight just for the sake of you know stealing a handful of grain you know he's lynched and 
you know, by the mob and murdered just for a handful of rice. It shows you where humanity is heading to really. I don't have much to say on that. It's for all of us to, to see, isn't it? Same as the case about, uh, about you know, uh, honor killing, uh, you know, that uh, there are still in an educated state like care life, this happens, then we can, can, we cannot even think of the rural hinterlands, you know, where it happens on such a massive, you know, uh, scale, you see. So, uh, yes. What do you copy, Tama? And then um, this is also like uh, discussing and uh, discussing a social issue. Like yeah. uh, what, as an academician or as a teacher and also as a research guy, what advice will you give uh, to those students, if any, um, like uh, Rohit Bemula, hmm. who might be going through such desperate situations like Rohit Bemula? What advice will you give them? See, um, what really transpires in the mind of, a, of an individual when uh, he or she sort of comes to this extreme uh, step is something neither you or me, you know, as an individual can really predict. But one thing is certain that uh, the situation, the, the, the circumstances prevalent are so extremely inhuman, are extremely unbearable, uh, you know, that, that a, young, a young boy, you know, a young uh, man like, like Rohit who had to sort of take his own life, it shows you the culmination it tells you where exactly, uh, what, what exactly is wrong with this whole setup, you see. That he has to, you know, uh, not that he was not a rational individual. He, through the letter that you have, uh, you could make out that he, he had a very inquisitive mind. He had a very scientific kind of a temperament. But that a man is compelled to take his own life. I think we should also ask this question, what drives a farmer to commit suicide? When you look at the numerous suicides that happen in Vidarbha, what goes on in that mind? I think uh, the whole idea of deprivation has to be revisited. The whole idea of how these oppressive structures are working in tandem to kind of make or drive an individual to that kind of state, you know, of making him feel a non-entity, you know, of uh, making him take that extreme uh, step I think we need to, as, as individuals, we all need to sort of sit and analyze how and what we can do is, you know, as, as, a, as a professor, uh, the only uh, uh, thing that I can do is perhaps, you know, render, uh, not that there aren't students who come to you, there, there are all sorts of students with all sorts of problems who come to you. But, you know, how you're able to, you have your limitations as an academic. On a personal level, yes, you can sort of counsel them or, you know, talk to them. But I think um, uh, by and large, uh, this, this setup uh, will drive you to this sooner or later. So it's very important for students to sort of make themselves so resilient. This is going to happen. Perhaps it will be even worse. Perhaps it's going to be even worse. Worse than what what... Uh, the existing scenario is. So I think preparedness primarily and not being, you know, allowing yourself to uh, let this whole machinery sort of overwhelm you to, to bring you to that uh, state of uh, making you feel like a non-entity. I think that's, that's what, uh, and it's, it's time where it's, it's uh, you know, it also necessitates the urge of what uh, the, the academia should, should also do, you know, I mean, such students, they need to uh, have the right approach, uh, the right, you know, they should approach the, the kind, right kind of people if, if they feel, uh, you know, left out or if uh, they feel. Uh, but I think to, to a great extent, it's also an eye opener. Rohit's uh, episode is an eye opener for, for academia, for the whole student community. It tells you where, uh, where it has, you know, brought humanity to, you know, it, it's speaking both ways. Uh, so uh, I don't know, Kavita, I, I don't know how uh, to answer this uh, because it's such an intricate kind of, as I said, what goes on into the innermost recesses of a person's mind is something neither you can predict nor me. Perhaps at times that is the only option, you know, 
So, uh, you know, uh, which of course, uh, I'm not sitting here to say it's right or wrong or anything. I won't do that. Because at times, I mean, you the countless farmers in, in Vidarbha who are committing suicide, you know, uh, what drives them to that, you know, to that stage of, so somewhere there is a fault. There is, and we know it. It's, it's just that we need to address this in more coherent, in more concrete, uh, in more, what should I say, uh, uh, forceful, uh, in a more forceful manner. This has to be addressed. Okay. Any other questions? I suppose we could listen to a couple more of her poems. Uh, like yeah. she was about to read a third translated poem. Mm, <laughs> that's when we interview. Shouldn't we end this session, Deepak? <laughs> Shall we end it by six? Uh, maybe o'clock? if you're tired, like maybe yeah. if you're tired, you could stop if you want. Like. I'll read one last translation and I, I, sure. I'll uh, stop. Okay, okay since yeah. all of you yeah. are so, uh, maybe one or two translations more and then I'll stop. Okay. I'll like have it. to again, my video will be off because I'll be reading from the cell phone again. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. So this is the title poem of this collection, Red Slogans on the Green Grass. And, uh, uh, I won't say much about it because I would want to have your responses to it now. Um, all right. So here it goes. Red slogans on the green grass. Before me continually stands Panchali, shamed in the assembly of the Kauravas. Ages and ages giving birth to Dushasanas, nurtured by society in its fold. The sun that sets in these wicked hands, keep it blazing. Let not the sky darken, hey Krishna. In your kingdom, mothers and daughters end your exploitation and your eyes are shunned thus. Don't replenish robes for the body, but the hands that dismantle those robes, dissever them from their stock. Don't let history repeat for a new Mahabharata. Else, we would also have to write red slogans on the green grass and blaze like the smoldering fire, seizing all sides on your part. You can return the title accorded to you, Messiah of poor and oppressed. And to heart's content, let become another Kurukshetra of this earth. So this poem, of course, uh, is a reference to, now we were just talking about honor killing and all of that. Panchali, as you know, was the wife of the five brothers, the Pandavas, you know. And uh, uh, so uh, references to that episode in Mahabharata, as you all uh, know through this reading. And uh, so the poet here is uh, talking, telling Krishna that, you know, instead of sort of providing, you know, that little episode uh, in, in Mahabharata where Draupadi is shamed in front of the whole assembly and you have Dushasana trying to disrobe her, you know, dismant he's dismantling her robes. And the poet here is telling uh, that don't do that. You rather you sort of dissever those hands from their very stock. So this kind of a, this poem actually becomes a paradigm for those countless rapes, uh, countless rapes and countless, you know, violations of women that are taking place uh, in the name of call it whatever, I rather not be very uh, vocal, but it doesn't matter in the name of religion, in the name of uh, call it whatever, you know, patriarchy. So this is like a reminder to Krishna that, you know, why are you providing robe to Draupadi? Why don't you cut the hands that are trying to dissever those robes? And therefore, for me, this becomes a very important poem because it, it, it speaks about, and then, hey, Krishna, you know, it's, it's to me somewhere I am reminded of Amrita Pritam, yeah, you know, uh, uh, where she speaks, uh, or, you know, post-partition and those countless uh, uh, 
uh, agonies and woes that the women in particular had to sort of face. Uh, and and she's uh, uh, she's uh, saying uh, you know in her beautiful invocation uh, where she's saying that uh, you know uh, where she's uh, telling uh, this poet that you know you had the heer uh, but there are countless heers there you know the heer ranja kind of story that you know there are countless heers who are being massacred who are being violated who are being raped you know what about those. Uh, so I think it it reminds me of of that really uh, as this poet as uh, uh, she's also trying to speak of those countless rapes and violations you know uh, in the name uh, so it's it's uh, telling Krishna that why do you need to provide robes you know rather you dissever those very hands that try to dismantle uh, otherwise we will have to write red slogans on the green grass so I think it's a very very powerful. Uh, poem, you know, that way. Uh, I'll read one more translation and uh, I won't hold uh, the audience for too long. Uh, I'll just read one last uh, uh, of my translation and then uh, perhaps we can uh, stop. Okay, there's this beautiful small poem that I always love, uh, you know, reading out uh, to the audience. This is called Alternative. Alternative, do my tears have all the wetness to drench the parched earth? Do my tears have all the wetness to drench the parched earth? Even the clouds when suffocated know to scream and react. Even the clouds when suffocated know to scream and react. The lightning too can be made to dance on the palm. But for me, out of all this, there is nothing as an alternative. The other poem is titled Lifelong Kinship. Nobody can snatch the songs from the enunciated lips of future. Nobody can snatch the songs from the enunciated lips of future. I am the living allegory of the annihilating sun that burns all darkness to rise. I am the living allegory of the annihilating sun that burns all darkness to rise. I will not let the robust minds in these settlements here vainly vanquish thus. I will not let the robust minds in these settlements here vainly vanquish thus. I will smolder the metal flames. And when the hamlets here burn, I will lend torches in every hand. Those that have drunk to the darkness of orthodoxy, those that invoke religions for self, for all such heads and pundits, I will dig mines, lay trenches and fill gunpowder to balk them all. Now none of these hilly terrains can ever scare me again. Now none of these hilly terrains can ever scare me again as I have a lifelong kinship with the tempestuous windstorm. Very, very powerful poem indeed. It tells you <laughs> the 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 kind of uh, poetry that uh, this generation of poets were writing. The last one uh, is titled, The Storm Has Not Risen Still. The storm has not risen still. The sky clipped your luminous wings. The sky clipped your luminous wings, yet the lakes of your compassion were unexhausted. The chokeful clouds became hamstrung before your countless sobs piled since birth. Your life became shreds with every passing day. None was so torn and broken as you. You, you took breath in installments while the sun unashamed watched with folded arms. 
every soul altered for convenience sake. Yet you never installed a smithy of words. You died every night to live. No graveyard offered you rest. The fierce lustre of your sweat sparkled. But here, but here, the darkness never sprouted with a vision. You kept dispensing in handfuls, while cursed words muttered and eclipsed your life. You resolved to sever ties forever. The clench remained far too tight. And here, and here, in these unruffled, stagnant, drooping waters, the storm has not risen still. The storm has not yet risen still. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, ma'am. That was like a great close to the session. I think Kavita ma'am wants to say something. Right. Probably uh, after that, we'll close it. Uh, yeah, ma'am. Very powerful poem asserting our own identity, uh, uh, asserting yes. our own self, assertion of self is evident in the poem. I loved it very much. And I think we have wonderful comments in the group uh, chat uh, as well. Uh, Deva, can you read some of them? Uh, yeah, they were all thanking her, yeah. uh, <laughs> saying that uh, poetry is indeed the paradigm of social change. And you have colored her emo emotions and happiness. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the session. And one had said uh, the registers were really impressive. I remember reading that. So, uh, so they are all highly excited about the poem. So with that, I'm we'll, so glad. Yeah, with I'm that, so we'll glad close. they liked it. With, with that, we will close today's session. Um, um, so, on behalf of Ideas in Progress, uh, Padhashana and Cambazine, I put on record, or rather formally put on record. Uh, our sincere gratitude to you, ma'am, uh, Aparna ma'am, for having joined us uh, and engaging with us for two hours. And we are precisely on time. And uh, uh, thank you, thank you very much for having joined us, um, taking your time out from a very busy travel day, <laughs> uh, as you would call it. Uh, my, my, only, my only regret is I'm just carrying nothing with me. <laughs> And uh, I, I wish uh, I could have, but uh, nevertheless, it was uh, it was equally uh, you know enlightening for me, and the enthusiasm uh, uh, shown, particularly the zeal shown by the participants, the kind of queries that were being put forth. So we have actually spoken of not just poetry, power, politics, all the P's. We are also talking about you know. The, the things that are happening around us and this is this is what makes makes it more uh, relevant and I really from the bottom of my heart wish to congratulate all of you who are behind this venture um, I'm so glad I could be part of uh, this uh, even though uh, there was a very you know very little time for me to sort of uh, sort of pile up and gather whatever I could lay my hands on uh, I'm sure we'll have many more interesting uh, sessions uh, in the near future with me uh, Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deepak. Thank you, Kavita, for uh, moderating the whole uh, session. Your queries were very, very interesting. Um, and uh, you can all, always revert back to me on my email uh, with, with all your uh, queries. I was absolutely, I mean, um, uh, 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 Chandra Mohan had told me, you, you just be there. That's it. <laughs> That's how I was here. Uh, so thank you, Chandra Mohan, <laughs> for thinking about me. Um, Thank you. Thank you all once again. Thank you, ma'am. I also thank take this so opportunity much, to so much. extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. Kavita BK for having joined us uh, to chair this session and interact with uh, Aparna, ma'am. Uh, thank you, uh, Kavita, ma'am. And uh, never the least, uh, thanks to Chandra Mohan uh, and all the participants for joining us today. And Chandra Mohan, especially for curating it too and opening our vistas of uh, understanding of poetry uh, by making us uh, listen to poets themselves speak about their ideas and philosophies. There's one little thing, uh, Deepak, uh, I would, uh, uh, I missed out telling Kavita and it suddenly yeah. struck me right now. 
mothers are very important when it comes to uh, poetry dalit poetry or whether it's uh, you know poetry from the marginalized groups she uh, is the torch bearer of of revolution you know uh, uh, the the potent uh, uh, you know uh, she leaves behind this potent legacy of uh, behind her and so mothers have always enjoy a very special place in in whether it's black poetry or uh, dalit poetry and uh, she holds a special uh, special place because it's there where the whole revolution uh, begins i think i missed out that point uh, absolutely ma'am what you said yes. is right yes uh, and i am very happy to be part of this venture and uh, it was an enlightening session ma'am i got uh, more ideas about uh, health literature today so i am very happy for the session thank you so much thank you thank you once again thank you all thank you thank you all tomorrow uh, we hope uh, saying tomorrow uh, with our new gang joining us uh, so I, i hope to see all of you tomorrow uh, thank you thank you all bye